Modern Melbourne is a series of interviews that document the extraordinary lives and careers of some of our most important architects and designers. Today we speak with Mary Featherston. After arriving in Australia from England in 1953, Mary trained in interior design at RMIT. In 1965, she formed a life and professional partnership with Grant Featherston. Over a period of 30 years, the partnership completed many iconic projects across interiors, furniture and exhibitions. Mary is also recognised for her pioneering work in children's learning environments. How did you know that design was your calling? What put you on the path to study interior design at RMIT? Well, I think it started in childhood um, with memorable experiences and, and as is so often the way I uh, well in fact I was born in, in near London in, at, towards the end of the war uh, when London was still being bombed um, but part of that childhood experience was that we had a neighbour who was an architect and uh, I remember special treats of being able to go and visit the architect and uh, for some reason that really um, triggered my imagination from a very, uh, well I would have been about um, eight or nine at that point. But also being in London I remember being taken to extraordinary spaces like the Tower of London and and cathedrals and uh, Though my parents were both uh, tradespeople with minimal education, they had a strong sense of the value of beauty and creativity in life. And so that, that I think, really moulded my, my thinking about the world. But we then left England and, and came to Australia, and on the way, um, our I remember very vividly visiting a cathedral which must have been in Port Side and this huge, vast space with uh, coloured windows and light pouring in through this colour. And again, that so, you know, just building up this this, um, vocabulary, I suppose, of, of space and wonder about space. So when we arrived in Australia, I went by um, accident, actually, to a, a private uh, school with a heavy academic uh, emphasis, which was not appropriate for me at all. Um, nobody there was interested in art and architecture, so I think I bailed out of there as soon as I could and went to RMIT to uh, do the interior design course. And then as part of that um, course, there were really two things that that happened that were seminal experiences that changed the course of my life. And one was an open day um, where we could visit Robin Boyd houses. And I remember going to two and it was a transformative experience. I realised... the possibilities for even residential architecture, the sort of exciting spaces that um, I didn't know at the time, but a great architect could could create. And so that was one. But the other, um, we had some quite wonderful lecturers at RMIT and one of them was extremely knowledgeable uh, about furniture and had a passion for furniture. And he took us to meet um, important designers around the town. And um, on one of the excursions, we went to Aristoc um, Industries, which was a uh, metal frame furniture manufacturer who was enormously successful. Uh, They were producing hundreds of thousands of designs. This is in the 60s at that point. And... um, Grant was the designer for the for Aristoc, and in fact he had helped to build the company into the success that it was. So he met um, 
this motley group of students and uh, talked to us, took us around the factory, which was you know, extremely interesting. But the thing that really um, impressed me was Grant's approach to design. It was um, a very... He had a very vigorous and rigorous approach to design and very intelligent. And at that point, he was already well recognised as um, one of Australia's leading furniture designer. He was, you know, technically and aesthetically uh, excellent. So I then badgered him to uh, see if I could work in his small studio at Aristoc. So those two, you know coming to know both Robin and, uh, well, Robin's architecture at that point and, and Grant was extremely important to me. Mm-hmm. So I'll, cu- I'll come back to Grant mm-hmm. and your, your life and career with Grant, um, but I'd like to speak about Robin Boyd. And mm-hmm. he, he is a reoccurring figure in your life and career and you've just spoken about him and that, that wonderful experience that you had at the Open Day. Um, but that you went on to, to collaborate and partner on the uh, Expo Talking Chair uh, on the NGV fit out and furnishings, and then on this wonderful and extraordinary house that we're sitting in today, how has he impacted your your life and, and your career? Oh, in so many ways. Um, but really, to go back to the beginning, Grant and Robin had had a long association. Uh, they'd done some important projects together, including a 1949 exhibition, uh, the the House of Tomorrow. In which which promoted the idea that um, good design can enrich everybody's everyday lives, um, but also Robin had championed and championed Grant's early uh, contour, you know, which was highly um, innovative and experimental. But but Robin promoted it in in the press through his column, and uh, used it in his building. So they. Um, they had developed a very strong mutual respect for one another's work and approach and I think shared a very similar approach and aesthetic, really. Uh, so then uh, we we married in 1965 and formed a partnership uh, because we'd found that even though we had this 20-year age gap, we in fact shared... Um, very similar responses to all sorts of things in life, particularly nature and uh, music, film, visual arts. So we'd formed um, a life and professional partnership and uh, the first commission was from Robin to design the talking chair for the Australian Pavilion at Expo in Montreal. And uh, though Robin had actually hadn't actually designed the building, Um, he had this remarkable uh, idea for the exhibition within the building um, because people get so fatigued in these enormous world fairs um, that what he wanted to do was to create a very comfortable sort of salon-like environment with chairs that as you sat into them you triggered um, information through the headphones about Australia. So this was, in fact, a very technically and aesthetically challenging project because the the form of the chair had to you know, be comfortable, like a lounge chair, like a wing chair. Robin had in mind, um, but also it had to hold the technology, the, the audio technology, and it had to relate to this vast space. And so the form that that Grant came up with was, uh, you know, I think ideal. It was, you know, like a tulip shape that that held the human body very um, beautifully. But also technically it it worked um, very well. So Expo was a technically challenging project in that um, there was very little time um, and these large chairs had to be transported from Melbourne to Montreal in a very short period of time. So in that case, we worked with um, uh, expanded rigid polystyrene to create the shell. 
And that was an excellent solution because it enabled Grant to work in you know, curvy linear forms because it's a moulded technology. But it was also lightweight to get it to, to Canada. So it, it was very successful um, in that way. Um, but hot on the heels of that project, uh, we were commissioned to do the fit out for the new National Gallery of Victoria in Swanson Street because it was moving from the old building in, in the library down the road to Swanson Street. Sorry, to St Kilda Road. And um, Robin was on the steering committee for that project and it was due to his influence, as I understand it now, that uh, Grant was commissioned to do that. Uh, that was a demanding job in a different way because the uh, the scope of the collections is so vast, all the way from tiny objects, you know, Egyptian beads through to huge sculptures and enormous carpets, and it's such a variety. And really, um, the curators didn't, know entirely what was in the collection because a lot of it was uh, hadn't been seen for years. So uh, that was most interesting, you know, d doing the initial research with the curatorial staff to uh, understand what the needs were and then um, to rationalise it into a sort of modular system of freestanding display, wall display, study storage. During that process, uh, we realised that we we actually needed um, different accommodation. At that stage, we were working in... We had two little flats that Roy Grants had designed during the war in Turak, and we lived in one and worked in the other, um, which wasn't entirely satisfactory. We needed something else. We couldn't find anything suitable to rent, and so Grant reluctantly decided we needed to own a house and if we were going to own a house, he thought we should ask Robin to design it for us. Um, by that time, uh, I knew many more of Robin's houses. They were uh, several people that we knew, friends had um, his houses. And each one of them was, was beautiful and remarkable in its own way and very much a response to the particular client. So. Um, the fact is that, that Robin was such an empathetic designer, such a, a, a delightful person as well, and so um, so curious, so in touch with what was happening in contemporary architecture and design, but also in, in across all areas of culture. Extraordinary person. Um, and I guess like us, he very much enjoyed um, Scandinavian design, Japanese design. So we asked Robin to design a house on this land on the creek, which is a fairly natural block of land. And um, we gave him our brief, which was quite odd, but Robin was used to, you know, that's I think what he was about. He was about rethinking ways of living um, and and wrapping an architecture around that. So he was as much concerned about interior space, perhaps even more concerned about interiors than the external appearance. Mm -hmm. And I've come to really love that about his work and appreciate it. So anyway, well, our brief was for um, spaces for our work, uh, you know, the studio, workshop, darkroom in those days, um, as well as uh, domestic spaces. But we also loved um, the, the Eames um, studio house and, and the idea that you could build a simple space just with industrial components. And we asked Robin, you know, could we, with this brief we have, could we um, build it out industrial components? And he said, no, actually, and unless you've got lots of money. <clears throat> it's cheaper to build in bricks and timber. As it happens, I think that was a good idea because it, it's a very organic um, building sitting in a very natural landscape. And the way Robin resolved um, our 
some might say conflicting needs of you know, personal and professional spaces, uh, has just been so wonderfully adaptable over the 50 years that we've now lived here. Um, it's met the sort of changing needs over time. Uh, sometimes it's been a photographic studio, sometimes it's been an assembly line for prototypes. You know, it's constantly a children's playroom, it's an experimental space. It's just worked so well. And the sense of being immersed in nature, as you can hear with, you know, the things falling on the roof, birds on the roof, um, is, it's given us such pleasure over such a long time because it is constantly changing. Mm. And now you're preparing to live here for many more decades with your, your growing family and, and grandchildren. So it's mm. incredibly adapt, ad, adaptable. Um, it's, it's wonderful how it's supported um, so many decades of a wonderful and rich life. Yes, and it has to be adaptable uh, to do that. And yes, as you say, we, I will move into the flat that was built for my parents originally, uh, a self-contained unit, and my son and his family will move into the main house. So we continue, yes. Now, we can't reflect on your life and career without talking about the ultimate partnership with Grant. You went from working with Aristoc Industries to moulded furniture to working with Uniroyal and many other furniture brands and companies. Can you tell me about the trials and tribulations during that period and also what Grant's lasting legacy is on, on your career? Well, in having had a very long association with, with Aristoc, um, which came to an end around 19... 70, sadly, um, we then had to find other clients urgently. Um, and But we wanted to continue innovating. We wanted to continue finding new ways, new technologies, new materials that could be used in mass production techniques in order to produce um, affordable, good design. You know, Grant and I were always very strongly committed to that view, that that was the role of design. Um, but the search for um, clients, manufacturers, who were, you could say, courageous enough, but also knowledgeable enough about their technology, that was very, very challenging. And we, <coughs> we worked with several different people with varying degrees of success. But the most, um, the most effective was with um, Uniroyal, who were then uh, suppliers to the automotive industry. But we had uh, found out that they were... They'd just got on top of the technology to mould uh, resilient, flexible urethane for car seats. And so we went to them and said we saw, saw potential to use this material and, and, and technology for mass-produced lounge furniture <clears throat> and for the domestic market. And they were quite enthusiastic and so we worked with them for quite a few years and did a number of ranges for them. And it was a very interesting project because we were actually able to reduce the chair, a lounge chair, to three components. The, the moulding that came straight out of the mould, one piece like a bun, um, a two-way stretch cover that could just be pulled over and tied around underneath, and a base, and that was it. That was a chair. And they were... Um, they were relatively affordable. It was, a, I think, a very successful project. But um, Uniroyal, who was an American company, was subsequently taken over by Bridgestone, which was a Japanese company. 
And at some point, you know, somebody in a boardroom in Tokyo said, well, what are we doing making furniture in Australia? And uh, pulled the rug on the project. So, it, you know, like the... Uh, the the end of Aristotle. It was another. It, it, look, it's been a roller coaster ride, I'd have to say. But to the question about the the legacy that that Grant has given me, I think it is in the. He was so courageous. He was so skilled um, in in so many aspects of design. Particularly in form giving, he, you know, it was a, he had a superb sense of of form. Um, whereas my interest was more in in space, his was in in form. Um, but it was the process that I particularly um, learned from him, and plus the um, the reinforcement of, of my view that. Design is about improving everyday life, not an elitist view of, of design, but um, perhaps you might say a more Swedish idea of design as part of life and design that must be both beautiful and practical. So after this period, you moved away from furniture design towards children's learning environments, projects that would positively impact local communities. What motivated you to shift your focus? I'd always been interested in children and creativity. And when our first son, Robin, was born in 1970, um, Grant and I had established the practice here in, in the house and we wanted to continue. Um, but at that point... And it's hard to believe now, but at that time there were really no um, out-of-home services, you know, childcare services. Well, there were there were kindergartens who would just take children for two or three hours a week, um, or there were daycare services which were very um, health-oriented. So you had got the split between education and and health and. Uh, so a number of us came together, and of course at that time there was such a ferment of, of um, questioning all sorts of social institutions, the, the, the family as well as children and family services. So a number of us came together um, to really say, well, we, we want to continue in our professions, and at that time women largely stopped work when they had children. We wanted to continue, but what sort of services would we like for our... What sort of experiences would we like for our children um, out of home? And uh, so it was a very interesting uh, activist group who were really reconceptualising the form of the service, the sort of relationships that we would want between um, adults and children in the services, the, the length of time they needed to operate how they would sit within the community, all these sort of questions. We wrote about it, published about it, and um, set up neighbourhood groups to establish their own um, children's services, little neighbourhood houses. So the idea was that they were embedded in the community close to the children that, and families that used them and that they were staffed by the um, parents in part together with professional staff. So as we discussed these ideas, as a designer, it seemed to me that they were also asking for different sorts of physical environments to those that we knew, the open kindergarten space or the separated daycare centres or singular classroom schools. There was no model that seemed appropriate to this new way of thinking. And I became intrigued. And uh, we, we in fact got a, a Commonwealth Research Grant to look at these new play learning needs um, at that point of preschool children. And so a number of these centres were set up 
with new thinking about the environment. And I think it was it was that experience, together with my observation of children in this house, um, where I came to see children as incredibly curious, active, imaginative, and one would find them, you know, deeply involved in doing things. Um, and you wouldn't say they were either play or learning. It was all intertwined. <clears throat> so I, I formed a view about, you know, what children were, how they liked to be in the world, and how they're driven to make meaning of their world. And at that time, I also started thinking about the cultural institutions and how they respond to this view of children. And the fact was, again, it's hard to believe, but at that time, the uh, gallery and the museum uh, had no, uh, no way of responding to children at all. Everything was behind glass in cases. And so then I got together another group and uh, we started to agitate to the arts ministry, finally to the museum, to think about setting up a children's museum. And finally the museum set aside a, a very beautiful gallery in the old building and commissioned me to develop and design interactive exhibitions for that space. So that, um, that again, was a new way of looking at things. It was breaking away from the, uh, the model of the adult museum to rethink, well, how do you respond to children who learn through all their senses as well as their intellect and who have you know, all sorts of experience of life and questions? How do you... How do you bring those together? How do you bring together the fabulous collections and expertise of our cultural institutions together with these you know, wonderful questioning minds? And so the first exhibition was about the human body. We decided that would be a good topic. It affects everybody. And uh, from my study of what had been going on in uh, America, where they had... A, they developed a lot of children's museums, not so much in Europe. But um, from that reading, it seemed to me very important to um, consult directly with children. And so I set up a process of uh, going to children and talking with them about what they would like to see in a, muse in, a in the first case, in an exhibition about the human body. And it was such a wonderful experience. Um, because the children were so full of ideas, and not only ideas about the content that they wanted, but also how it could be interpreted in the museum. So that led to um, a highly interactive thematic exhibition, which was enormously su successful. I mean, one has to say there was very little competition at that point. Um, so there were huge visitor numbers. And... Uh, it was just marvellous to see the way children and families interacted with these exhibits, how they uh, test things out, talk about them. And that led me to, to then questioning, well, if this works so well for children, if they're so engaged, why are schools so different? And... So several decades later, I think I'm still asking the question, uh, through my interest in Scandinavian design um, and a wonderful magazine that we used to get called Form from Sweden, I read about an amazing project in um, <clears throat> Reggio Emilia in the north of Italy. And this was a system of, of schools that had been established in the 60s who were really uh, very much uh, taking the view that children are competent and curious. And how do you <clears throat> design a, a pedagogy and physical environments to support that? And so I went to uh, visit 
Ridgeway Million in 1992. And that was such an affirming um, experience to see that uh, this community of people, this whole community, whole city, um, supporting this network of schools that were doing such wonderful things with children. And from the very beginning, they realised, uh, particularly the director, Loris Malaguzzi, realised that you cannot... Um, you cannot change the pedagogy, you can't change the relationships and experiences within the schools unless the physical environment supports that. And so that was an enormous learning experience for me. And I then, um, well, helped to set up a, uh, an information exchange in Melbourne that linked to Richard, and through that I met wonderful educators who were in, in in various schools, early childhood, primary, secondary, who all felt there's a better way of doing it and but that we needed to work together to find you know ways of doing it within the Australian context. And that led me to uh, Bialik College, uh, there, who were then establishing a new early learning centre and they were um, enthusiastically taking up ideas from Regio, because it was very compatible with their approach. Um, and so I, with them I developed a system of modular furniture that was very adaptable and that could be used within uh, relatively uh, traditional spaces to, to create different sorts of environments. And that subsequently uh, has been sold all over Australia and in, in New Zealand as well. Um, and then uh, I worked with Warana Park in, in Dandenong, which is a, a government-funded primary school with um, in a very uh, different socio-economic group to the Bialik and with many different nationalities, but with passionate um, leadership there, a leadership team who were very committed to re-examining their theory and practice and could see, again, the need to uh, change their approach to the physical environment to support that. Uh, and we were able to set up a little research <clears throat> project that, again, involved the children very actively in exploring possibilities and you know, taking them on excursions to see a great variety of spaces uh, for them to really... Um, think about how they would like to do things differently. And we were, so we worked together. It was a very collaborative project and arrived at um, very different environments. So the thing that is different about them, but you could say that there's a whole history of progressive schools going back over 100 years that uh, where the approach to children and learning is much more about uh, recognising that children need to learn actively, they love to work together, to learn together, um, that they like to form strong relationships, the importance of experiential hands-on learning, the need for choice and spontaneity means freedom of movement. And so these spaces um, uh, are very fluid, a bit like the house. And, you know, in retrospect, I can say Oh, we you know it was living in this, this um, very particular spaces of this house that made me realise that you can create um, very discrete settings that have a particular uh, that support particular kinds of experiences, but within one overall space. So that in the, in here you're always constantly linked to other spaces, but once you're in the space you have a sense of containment. And so I think that the house has actually been very influential on my thinking. It's emboldened me to work in a different way. So over the years, I've worked in early childhood primary and secondary and with, with the same approach but across all levels, whereas in fact 
the traditional model is, uh, the traditional formulas are very different for early childhood primary and secondary. Uh, so the, the the ideas have had you know some currency. They're now influencing the form of new government funded schools. So reflecting on the past fifty years, what do you see as the opportunities and challenges in contemporary learning environments? Are we close to reaching the ideal of pedagogy and physical environment working in harmony, or are we far apart from that? There's a long way to go. Um, there are some beacons on the hill, you know, there are the remarkable projects like Rich Armenia that um, continually evolve over decades. Uh, they just get richer and more wonderful. And then more recently, there's a network um, in Los Angeles, the high tech high schools, which now cover primary and, and secondary, that I would say are working with similar ideas and practice where kids are involved in really long-term inquiry projects um, and very um, very active and very relevant. They're really calling on children's um, interests and experiences but linking it with passionate um, and knowledgeable uh, teachers. So I think there are beacons on the hill. But overall, and this is internationally and not just Australia, education is a very conservative area and has really changed little over um, decades. Uh, but the fact is that the contemporary world is moving so quickly and the needs, uh, the needs for you know, the competencies of graduates is, is changing so dramatically. Technology is changing. Business is changing. That uh, there is a very great need to reimagine uh, the education system. And, of course, many luminaries you know, across the world are saying just that. We, we must change. But... Uh, Unfortunately, I think too much of the change is in more in the na nature of reform, you know, just tweaking little bits of the system rather than transforming it. Uh, I suppose the irony is that, that the design of the physical environments has moved further than the pedagogy. So we've now got spaces that are being created uh, which hopefully will support a very different way of uh, learning and relating, but the pedagogy needs to also change. So looking in retrospect at your rich and collaborative career, what are you most proud of? Look, I think, I think I'd have to say the thing that I'm, I don't know about proud of, but the thing that's given me most pleasure has been the work in education, um, but it's it's to do with working with teams of people. It's the collaboration. It, it's being able to uh, work on these projects that require uh, it, this social activism. It's about changing social norms. It's about cultural change. And that can only come about if... Um, people from very diverse backgrounds come together with something of the same values and beliefs, um, but different skills, so that you bring that together in a you know collective project. And it's the it's the thrill and the pleasure of moving forward uh, with a group of like-minded people. Thank you, Mary. It has been absolutely delightful to speak to you today. Thank you for making the time. Thank you, Emma. <laughs>